Oh, hey, good morning. Bright and early. Um, well, early, anyway. Um, so today we're uh, going on to look at um, Evans on the causal theory of names. But I want to wrap up first thinking about color. Um, color re isn't really discussed in the texts that we're looking at, but I think it's an interesting case as a kind of um, exercise for a causal theory of representation. Because we do represent the world as colored, that, that, that seems like a datum. And in a causal theory, there's a question, how can that be happening? What is it that we're causally responding to that is allowing us to represent the world as having all these qualitative colors? Um, and on a natural story, um, the world out there isn't itself colored. The world out there doesn't contain these qualitative characteristics. The world out there only contains light of various wavelengths, not the qualitative color characteristics themselves, the blueness of the blue thing and so on. So how come we are managing to represent these qualitative characteristics if there is nothing qualitative out there for us to be causally responding to? And the natural answer that I guess many of you guys were defending last time was that um, it's something to do with our color sensations. We have inner qualitative sensations, and our color representations are causally responsive to those inner color sensations. And um, the bombshell on which we ended last time was that this talk about color sensations doesn't make an ounce of sense. Um, I, I, th th this is... Um, uh, a dramatic claim, I realize, because it's a very popular view, not just in this class, but in philosophy generally, that there are sensations of color. But it seems to me that it really is a difficult notion, because on the one hand, the color sensations are supposed to be what we have most immediate knowledge of. They're what inject your consciousness of color into vision. So th th they're what you have your first and most immediate knowledge of in having knowledge of our, our colors. But on the other hand, when you just reflect for a moment on your own current visual experience, your own current, current visual experience doesn't give you any knowledge of color sensations at all. Your own current visual experience only gives you knowledge of the colors of the objects around you. It only gives you knowledge of color as a characteristic of concrete objects. So you could say, well, I'm going to hypothesize that there's something you don't have any direct knowledge of, namely these color sensations. And these color sensations would be like postulates, like the electron is a postulated object. You could say color sensations are like electrons. They're postulated to explain what goes on. And then you might form hypotheses about how they behave, just as you can form hypotheses about how electrons behave. Um, but the position you reach at this point is actually incoherent because nothing can be both. Nothing can be both a purely theoretical postulate um, hypothesized in order to explain what's going on. And on the other hand, the thing that we have most immediate um, knowledge of in ordinary color experience was providing us with knowledge of the blueness of the blue thing. I mean, you might go try going down either of these tracks, but... The current position is that you try going down both of them at once, and that is incoherent, it seems to me. So if we reach that point and we say, well, where is this qualitative character? Um, we can't take it as a given that the representations have it. Um, so it must be a characteristic either of inner sensation or of the world out there. Um, actually, the most popular view is that we, we don't say it's a col color is a characteristic of the world out there. And I think a lot of people would say this talk about color sensation, not most, but many philosophers would say this talk about color sensation is kind of problematic. It, it's not obvious that it really makes sense. So um, why don't we think instead of the qualitative characters of the objects around us as that's something we represent the world to have. We represent the world to have the blueness, the redness, and so on. It doesn't really have those qualitative characteristics. We just represent the world that way. And if you put it like that, you don't need to bother talking about sensations at all. Does that sound like a sensible view? 
Can you put your hand up if that sounds reasonable enough? I mean, it might be wrong, it might be uh, right, but it's, at any rate, it's reasonable enough. Yeah. The thing is, <laughs> that was a trap. I, I think that makes no sense. Whatever, if you have a causal theory of representation, there is nowhere really to go here. Because if you have a causal theory of representation, then um, to be representing the qualitative colors, that you have to, your representations have to be causally responsive to the qualitative colors. But where are the qualitative colors that your system of representation is causally responding to? There are no qualitative colors out there. We're assuming there's only the light wavelengths. There are no qualitative colors in here, in your sensations. That's the other thing we're assuming. So there's no way in which those representations could now be representing the qualities of color. I mean, a causal theory of representation needs two things. It needs the representation and it needs the phenomenon that the representation, the representation is causally responsive to. So the point we've now reached is, we say there aren't the color sensations in there, there aren't the colors out there, so um, uh, how could the representations be representing qualitative colors? There's no qualitative characteristic of sensation, no qualitative characteristic of the objects out there to be causing the representations. Um, I think my own view is the only way to go here is uh, to say, well, if you talk about color sensations, really doesn't make sense. It really is kind of obscurantist to talk about these color mm. sensations when we don't understand exactly what they are and we don't have any everyday commonsensical knowledge of them. Then why not take the appearances at face value? Why not suppose that really the objects out there have the qualitative colors they seem to have? Um, and uh, the physics is just incomplete. There is more to the world out there independent of us. There is more to the mind independent reality than just the physics of the situation. What more there is are the primitive color characteristics of the objects. So if the objects really are in themselves, blue, red, yellow, and so on, then our color representations can have the contents that they do as responses to those qualitative characteristics out there. And we don't have to bother with this difficult talk about color sensations. We can explain the whole thing in terms of a causal theory of representation. But note that the pressure that a causal theory of representation puts you on here, if you've got the representation with a particular kind of, and is representing things a particular way, there must be something there that is that way in order for the representation to be representing it as that way. Was that a bit too fast? Do you, do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah. They're good. Sorry? That was, did you say that was okay or that was not okay? Yeah. <laughs> do it again. Okay. If you're going to have a causal theory of representation, then that's to say you've got the representations over here. That's the representations. Yes? Um, and a causal theory says the only way the representations gets to be a representation of that Q let's say, is if there's some Q out here causing the representation. Yeah. You could only have a representation of Gödel if there's Gödel out there causing your use of the name. You could only have a representation of water if there's water out there causing your use of the sign. You could only have a representation of color if there's color out there causing your use of the sign. I mean, when people say there's no smoke without fire, in a way that's actually literally applicable here because, <laughs> I mean, of course there can be smoke without fire. I mean, I'm not denying that. But um, there's something right about it, which is we treat smoke as a sign of fire. Smoke is a sign of fire in the sense that it's reliably caused by fire. That's all right. That wasn't too fast. Yeah. You see smoke, you can say I, that's fire. That smoke means fire, you can say, right? The smoke indicates the presence of fire. That couldn't be unless there was usually fire out there causing the smoke. So similarly, you can't have a representation of water. The water indicates the presence of the water representation indicates the presence of water. The color representation indicates the presence of color. But it couldn't do that unless there were colors out there. Uh, oh, oh boy, okay. One, two, three, yeah.
the representation is itself the cause. So the rep uh, it causes itself. That's right. We get color representations from somewhere. That's that's the whole point. Yeah, that's a central thing, right? Whether you agree with anything else I say here, that's the important thing. A color representation is not self-standing. Its meaning is not kind of generated from within. It's always generated from something that's causing it. That's true of representation in general. That's the claim of a causal theory. Yeah. The cause and the effect must be two different things. Things can't cause, I mean, they sometimes said that God is his own cause. Yeah, go, 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 yeah. But that, that's a very unusual case. Um, things can't in general cause themselves. If you catch a disease, yeah, then, and you say, how, did, how come that happened? Then the answer just can't be, well, it caused itself. You should get another doctor to tell you that, right? <laughs> Yeah, things can't cause themselves. It makes no sense. Uh, well, okay, you'd have to be saying this is a very special case, right? The whole idea of a causal theory is there's the water out there and the representation of water. There's a name girdle and the person girdle, and one's causing the other. They are two different things, and one causes the other. Yeah. This idea of a representation causing itself, on the face of it, it makes no sense. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't mean to be um, pejorative here, but really, I mean, um, um, if you said, well, where did the chalk come from? How was it made? Um, the idea, oh, well, it made itself. I mean, how, how could that be? You, you see what I mean? But that's what you'd have to be saying about the color representation. Oh, it made itself. Uh, how does that work? Oh, yeah, we, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you do. So you said that maybe the problem here is that physics is incomplete. That's right, physics is incomplete, yeah. That's right. You, you could say that. I mean, it, it, it's a, a lot of uh, uh, brain science is actually very puzzled by this picture that um, you do get people who go through assemblies of cell firing saying, now where do we get the color qualia? Where do the color qualia come? And you keep turning over these assemblies of cell firings looking for the color sensations. And they're so hard to find. And, you know, the truth is you could trace um, a bunch of hits in the retina all the way through to the back of the brain, all the way through to the front of the brain, all the way through to action, and, and never notice color sensations at any point. Yeah? So it is very puzzling for the scientists who are thinking about where consciousness is. How, how shall we find it? And um, the, the, you, you get reactions like, well, maybe if the mathematics is sufficiently complex, we, we will find the color sensations. But it really seems that it is not a matter of mathematical complexity. Um, the thing isn't there at all. And it seems to me at that point a natural reaction to say, well, where do the colors seem to be? They seem to be out there on the objects. Yeah, maybe you're just looking in the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Oh, I, I just said there's this basic incoherence in the other one. Oops, going the wrong way here. Um, uh, I said that the color sensations are kind of incoherent because on the one hand, they're theoretical postulates that we don't know anything about uh, directly. Yeah, they're just postulated, and that's the kind of line you're taking. They're in there in the brain somewhere, and future research will tell us something about them. Um, but on the other hand, they're also supposed to have this characteristic that they're, they're the most immediate thing you have knowledge of in everyday visual experience. Now, I think it's perfectly um, 
uh, reasonable to say, I'm going to forget about this part, the special insight into them. Let's suppose they're backstage. Yeah. Um, the, I think that's, the, the, that's a perfectly defensible view. It really is obscure, though. I mean, you, you, know, you lose the sense that you, you have to, how should I say, knowingly give up the sense that you know what you're talking about when you talk about color sensations and say it's just this postulated black box backstage in consciousness somewhere. And if that's the deal, then I, I have no problem with that in principle. But it's, it's not one many people have gone down. It's not what usually they have in mind when they talk about color sensations. On the other hand, they talk about the colors of medium-sized objects. That we understand, you know, we use a million times every day. It's, it's a robust, well worked terminology. There's nothing obscure about it. So that's why I like it better. But that's not to say that's decisive. So I think the track you're suggesting is perfectly reasonable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, <laughs> this was meant to be a kind of, by the way, so <laughs> we, 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 I, 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 Put your hand if you've got a question. Uh, okay, you, you, you had a question. Uh, you, you, okay, this is going to be really quick. Okay, well, one line, and I'll, I'll try to talk for less than 20 minutes each time. One, two, yeah. Okay, so um, your primitive view, is it like um, you see something and then you translate it, you see a light wave, and then you translate it into a color? No, you see a color. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not translation. It's causation, is the key thing here. Yeah. So I'm not saying your brain interprets the. Th th that's what the last commenter was saying. Your brain interprets the stuff out there as colors. I'm saying the colors are out there, and your brain just causally responds to them. If it seems to you like, unless you have a, something of a startle reaction, you don't really understand what I'm saying. Because most educated people today would take it for granted that that's false. Yeah, that the colors are somehow generated by the mind. But I'm suggesting that that's wrong. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not wrong. That's right. Could you speak up, please? <laughs> <laughs> Did you say it's not wrong? Wait, wait, I'm saying uh, it's caused by the light. No, I'm saying it's caused by the color. <laughs> that's right. That's how come you've got a representation of the qualitative color. If it's caused by the wavelengths out there, you have no idea how it came about that you've got a representation of a qualitative color here. That's the problem. Yeah, that's where we come in with that basic difficulty. Uh, one, two, yeah. Um, last time you talked a little bit about why we can't have knowledge of, uh, of our color sensation. Yes, right. Uh, yeah, well, I was saying when you try and reflect on the nature of your current color experience, you wind up just looking at the world around you. So, but if that's the case, then, like, doesn't that sort of imply that we can't have any knowledge whatsoever of any of our mental states at all? No, you can have knowledge of, of what you're seeing. Well, I, what, I, 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 in order to describe what you're seeing, you describe the world around you. But that is knowledge of a mental state. What was going wrong there is a picture of knowledge of your own mental state as knowledge of something in here, a bunch of sensations confined to your head. You have to think of the color experience, as some, the, your ordinary seeing of things, as something that connects you to the world out there. That's what a causal theory is saying. Remember that, that thing about the thinker? Um, the whole point there was you can't know whether you're thinking about H2O or XYZ just by looking inside your head. The whole point about this, this is what I mean about how deep this causal theory goes, um, is that that picture of your mind is something separated out from the world that you can have knowledge of, independent of your knowledge of your environment. That is getting blown up here. Yeah. Uh, the, the, and and that, I think that's what's behind your question. Yeah. So in describing the environment, you are describing, I mean, when you're describing what you're seeing, you describe your environment all right, but you're thereby describing your mental state. It's, com it's common sense, but it's wrong. <laughs> that's, the, <laughs> that, the, the, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I do recognize the, uh, the intuition there. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, you just have to, we would just have to uh, sort that out the way the, the way we do ordinarily. I mean, like, it's like if I if I um, if I'm in a store and I buy a, I ask for a blue shirt and uh, they bring me something and I say that's not a blue shirt that's a green shirt, then you know these these disputes do come up. Yeah, I've actually been in a not in that context exactly, but I've been in at least one. Quite impassioned argument about whether something was blue or green, um, and you just have to settle that the way people usually do. You know, you look at color charts, you talk to other people, um, you kind of get recalibrated. I, I, I don't know what you know. We do get into these disputes, and we do settle them, but all at the level of common sense. Yeah. Okay, last one. Yeah, yeah. What about what? Sorry. An abstraction is paid to. Yes, right. Oh, that, that, that's, that's right, and that's interesting. Um, but, um, well, it's a complex case. But with the, in the case of water, right, you can, have a, you can do a painting of water. It can be meant to be water. Yeah? You draw, you, you, you draw that. There it is, the bottle that says Perrier. It's meant to be water. There's the glass. There's the bubbles, right? It's water. It's all, all right. Um, but there's no such scene in reality. Yeah? For you to be responding to. But still, it could be that the only way you can have a system of representation in which you can do that kind of stuff is that there are colors out there. Sorry, is that there is water out there in that example. The, the abstract painting is a little bit fancier because it's not, I mean, the whole, it, there's something about it. It's not naturalistic, right? Um, but I think with a color, with an abstract painting, the thing is the, th the painting itself is colored. Yes? Is ah, it's a painting in your mind. Ah, <laughs> that's a very fancy example. Okay, there's a painting in your mind, but it's not. Okay. Right. Let, let me just make this general uh, point that it's one thing to say, in order for the system of representation to exist, the phenomenon must be out there to be causing you to use that system, right? That's what happens with water or girdle or whatever. Yeah, you can only have those representations if the stuff's out there. Um, uh, but that's not to say that every representation you form using that system has to be an accurate representation of what's going on. Yeah. So I, I don't, that, that doesn't comprehensively address your, your, your example, but that, that, that's, where you'd, that's where I think you'd start. Okay, okay. I, I just want to make one final remark that takes a bit further that last question, that what last but one question about um, uh, different people representing things differently. Um, if you, say, I, I just say this to try and make clear what the position is I'm suggesting. If you say that um, the colours are out there just the way we see them, you have to face the fact that lots of other animals seem to have different kinds of colour vision to us. So. Um, uh, Goldfish, for example, seem able to uh, see into the ultraviolet. Lots of uh, birds seem to have ultraviolet vision. There are lots of birds that to us look drab and uh, uh, ravens and crows and so on. And then when you flood them with light in the wavelengths in which they see each other, if you see what I mean, um, they turn out to be differently, brilliantly colored. Um, so. Uh, if you take the goldfish or if you take bird vision like that, um, then what are we going to say about it? Is it that we see the colors right and they see them wrong? Or do they get it right and we get it wrong? Um, surely we can face off a goldfish. Um, but um, we, we do seem to be have this question which is really kind of amping up that thing. They see, you, you know, it's one thing, I, I, I fobbed you off by saying, um, well, we do actually resolve these differences, but with a goldfish, no amount of talk is going to. Re well, I mean, <laughs> <it's> not, <laughs> you see what I mean. <laughs> um, 
And really, uh, uh, so, so I just raise that. I don't want to try and address that here, but um, I just raise that to try and make clear what the view I'm recommending is, that um, it's a view in which the goldfish really is a threat. Um, so, uh, and the question for you is, if you don't buy that pi picture, then what causal theory would you like of color representations? Okay, that's homework. So, um, we, we, we re I really want to move on to the Evans now, okay? Um, so, I want to um, just whistle through and pr uh, revive your memories of what, what, what was going on with Kripke. Kripke, Kripke, do you know Kripke? It's, it seems like a long time ago now, but you remember Kripke? Kripke? Yes. Um, one way to think of it with the Kripke is you can think of ourselves as having files on the things and people and objects around us. I kept saying, well, the causal theory says someone radiates information about themselves into the community. We build up a cluster of descriptions um, relating to that individual. So you can think of that as each of us having a dossier on that individual. Each of us has our Mitt Romney dossier. Each of us has our dossier and our friends. You build up all this information is true of them. And then the question is, what is the relation that has to hold between the information that's in a file and the person it's of for that person to be the person the file's about? Yeah, what, what, how do you explain what that relation is between the dossier and the person? Um, and the description theory said it has to be the person who best matches what's in the dossier. And Kripke gave a quite different answer. He said, um, consider your Gödel dossier. Um, your Gödel dossier contains a whole bunch of information, principally relating to the person who proved these mathematical theorems. But suppose that the, uh, the person who actually uh, proved the incompleteness of arithmetic was someone else, someone outside the Gödel gang. Um, then uh, that other person would be the person who best matches the contents of your Gödel dossier. But um, that still, Gödel would refer to the person who stole the credit. Right? That was the point. The source of the dossier, not the person the dossier best matches. I'm racing over this, but I, I assume that this is familiar at this point. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the Kripke picture was there's an initial baptism in which the thing may be named by extension or the reference to the name may be fixed by description. And a chain of communication in which a name is passed from speaker to speaker. And what is um, railing up Evans in this article is the focus on the initial baptism. The thing about the initial baptism is that it might be lost in the mists of history. And who cares what the initial baptism was? Um, it, it, it seems to bear no relation to the way, necessarily to the way we use the name now. And it's not at all clear how to explain what a chain of communication is either. Um, so I, I said, if you say, well, uh, Rumsfeld, I think, is the name of a pre-Socratic philosopher. Um, I just picked up a little bit of conversation about Rumsfeld, about known unknowns and all that. And I thought, yeah, that's a pre-Socratic. Sounds like a pre-Socratic to me. Um, then do you really understand the name? I mean, the chain, the causal chain goes back to Donald Rumsfeld's initial baptism. No argument about that. That's really what's going on from your use of the name back to the politician's baptism. But um, um, if your use of the name is so out of joint, if you raise questions like, did Rumsfeld um, influence Plato? Um, then um, you know, you, <laughs> your use of the name seems to be so out of sync with any talk about the politician that you wonder what point is there in saying you're referring to the politician. Uh, Evans writes, one could regard the aim of this paper as being to restore the connection which must exist between strict truth conditions, um, including the account of reference, and the beliefs and interests of the users of the sentences if the technical notion of strict truth conditions is to be of interest to us. So that's to say, talking about what someone's referring to isn't a purely technical exercise. It has to fit in with how, it has to um, relate to the kind of interest that our thought and talk have for us, what work thought and talk do in our everyday lives. It's not just a technical question, what you're referring to when you use a sign. Um, 
And so here's an example to suggest that the initial dubbing ceremony that uh, Kripke talks about can't really have that kind of force that Kripke supposes. Suppose one of a group of villagers dubbed a little girl uh, on holiday in the vicinity Goldilocks, and the name caught on. However, suppose there were two identical twins that the villagers totally failed to distinguish. It just happened that at the initial dubbing, one of them ran in range of the dubber, and the dubber said, I dub thee Goldilocks. And it was just an accident they got that one rather than the other one. The two of them kept running around. Um, then Evan says, I should deny that Goldilocks is the name of either. I mean, since, it, how should I say, in the life of the villagers, there is no significant distinction drawn between the two twins. The mere accident that a dubbing ceremony caught one of them rather than the other can be of no relevance. Or Here's another example. An urn is discovered in the Dead Sea containing uh, documents on which are found fascinating mathematical proofs. Inscribed at the bottom is the name Ibn Khan. And um, for decades, mathematicians study these proofs uh, talk about what Ibn Khan did and didn't understand, talk about Ibn Khan's level of mathematical sophistication, and so on. Um, and they've never noticed, right at the bottom, in very small print, it says, Id scripts it, I'm the scribe, I'm the humble writer down with the proofs, not the mathematician myself. Um, and Evan says, are you really going to say that when for decades mathematicians have been arguing about um, whether Ibn Khan was really in a position to prove, let us say, the incompleteness of arithmetic. Um, uh, they were talking about the scribe, because that's the person who was first dubbed Ibn Khan. No, they were talking about the mathematician. So Kripke's talk about the, the importance of the initial dubbing seems to be giving an importance to an almost accidental ceremony that it doesn't really have. And the idea of the chain of communication is also pretty problematic. Kripke says, what's a chain of communication? Well, when the names pass from link to link, the receiver of the name must, I think, intends when he learns it, to use it with the same reference as the man from whom he heard it. And Evans's point is, um, that can't be a correct account of the chain of communication. Consider um, uh, Marco Polo's naming of Madagascar. Marco Polo is standing in the mainland, presumably around Mozambique somewhere, um, looking out at this great island, and he says to the locals, what do you call that? And they think he's pointing to a bit of the mainland. They think he's pointing to the hills over the coast. And uh, they say, that, that's Madagascar. And he takes them to be referring to the island. So he's making a mistake about what they're referring to. He thinks they're referring to this. They are actually telling him the local name of a bit of the headlands out in Mozambique. And um, he is uh, intending, in Kripke's phrase, he is intending to use it with the same reference as the people from whom he heard it. But he's not. I mean, if you really took Kripke's story seriously here, then there's a chain going from you and me today and the makers of this map today um, back through to Marco Polo, back through to the locals back then. Um, all of us intending to use the name with the same reference as the people from whom we heard it, right back to the, the locals' initial dubbing of that bit of the headland, um, Madagascar. So if, uh, if we really took Kripke's theory seriously, you'd have to say, Madagascar's not an island. Madagascar's just a bit of the mainland of Africa. But that is a crazy view. That's the thing about... This would, this would be a purely technical notion of reference that it doesn't bear any relation to the way we actually use the name Madagascar every day or how we actually assess what each other are saying is true or false. Okay, so the basic point there about the Madagascar example is that reference can shift despite a causal chain on an intention to preserve reference. And we've actually had this point already. I mean, in that affecting story of spot, that's exactly what happens. I mean, I won't, I, won't, I won't walk through that painful story again, but, yeah, you can remember it, right? It's the same model. Okay? Okay. So the, 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 that's the uh, Evans' line of attack in Kripke. Now, there are, what he does, um, 
uh, to respond to Kripke is he introduces the notion of a dominant source of information. Uh, when you try and explain this uh, abstractly, I think it's quite a difficult notion to give a, 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 a fully explicit account of. So I'll work through his attempt to give a fully explicit account of it, and then I'll look at his example. I think the example, Napoleon, makes it very vivid what he means, and makes it very clear that there is some idea there, however unsatisfactory the, um, the notion of a dominant source of information is. It is. Your, your task as homework is to improve that definition of a dominant source of information. Here's a kind of definition that Evans gives. A speaker intends to refer to the item that is the dominant source of uh, the associated body of information. So in the case of Madagascar, um, you get a bunch of information about Madagascar. You have a whole bunch of impressions about Madagascar. You have your file on Madagascar. What matters is not who is at the end or what is at the end of some long historical chain going back through the centuries. What matters is, look at your body of information as you have it now. What is the dominant source of all that information? Is it the island or is it the, the headland? Um, usually our knowledge or belief about particular items is derived from information gathering transactions involving a causal interaction with some item or other conducted ourselves. Or, or, as in the case of Madagascar, you can get it through a long chain. Or if it's someone who's moved in next to you, you can get it just by directly interacting with them, not through a long chain. You can find out about a person from a perception, from a photograph, from rifling through their suitcase, from burgling their house, um, or finding out what other people say. Uh, you can find all about this person one way or another. And that gives you a file, that gives you a cluster or a dossier of information on that person. Now, when you're getting that cluster, uh, putting together your file on that person, you might mix up information from different people. A cluster or dossier of information can be dominantly of an item, though it contains elements whose source is different. So if you've got a photograph like this, I was trying to find a photograph I could show at this hour of the morning of two people kind of all tangled up. Um, so here you have information coming from two rugby players, right? Yes? Yes, that's all right. So you're getting information here. Um, uh, so it's all mixed up. But in my view, your information is dominantly of the guy in the front. You're getting more and more and clearer information about the guy in the front. So even although you've got here something that is giving you information about two different people, you can say, well, it's really dominantly of one rather than the other. Evan says dominance is not simply a function of the amount of information. Even if you could quantify information, it's not just going to be a matter of how much information. Um, in the case of persons, for example, each man's life presents a skeleton and the dominant source may be the man who contributed to covering most of it rather than the man who contributed most of the covering. So what he has in mind, I think, if, for example, we know a bit about, um, let's say, uh, Maxwell, um, um, the great physicist, um, then um, it may be that we actually have um, some scans that were done of Maxwell's knee that... Um, give you a massive amount of information about Maxwell's knee. So we know far more about his knee than we know about um, anything else that Maxwell did. Um, and uh, even if that scan, it turned out, we were all wrong about That wasn't really Maxwell's knee at all. You, you see what I mean? That could happen, um, too. Um, what matters is not who, who contributed most of that information, if most of the information relates to the knee. What we want is where, where the overall shape of Maxwell's life and achievements comes from the overall picture. That's the, so, so the important thing is who contributed to covering most of the skeleton, not the fact that you're getting a massive amount of detail of some relatively unimportant part of the skeleton. Yeah. I'm whistling through this a little bit, but because uh, I hope it's plain enough, but halt me at any point. You might want to speed up a bit, <laughs> which is harder to do. But if this, OK, happy with that? Okay, so dominance is, oh, what have I done? Um, 
So detail in a particular area can be outweighed by spread. Detail in uh, the coverage of the knee can be outweighed by spread in the coverage of the life. And your reasons for being interested in the item at all will also weigh. So Imogen Dickey uh, has a couple of examples that really test out this notion of dominance. One is, um, these, these are in the paper just out this year. One is, uh, suppose you have a village with an astrologer who fastens on to a two-year-old child and says, this little girl will do great things. This little girl is a child of destiny. Um, and uh, she generates a whole bunch of predictions about the great things this little girl will do for the village. And maybe 10 years down the line, those legends are alive and well, and people remember relatively little about the actual life of the little girl. Still, that little girl is the, is the, is the person you're talking about. That little girl is a person that all the legends are of, even though the little girl contributed relatively little to all these fabulous legends that have grown up around her. Or again, it could happen that with Chaucer, um, um, uh, it could be, have been that in the Middle Ages, a whole bunch of myths grew up about Chaucer, the early English um, writer, and um, that uh, people in the Middle Ages believed mostly a bunch of nonsense about Chaucer, so that actually the, um, they believed he was a saint, they believed he had magical powers, I don't know, wh whatever stuff you like, but actually um, uh, Chaucer himself was not the dominant source of all these legends, um, it could still be that uh, 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 eventually all these legends are scraped away and we've got stories about the real Chaucer. I, I usually just love to, I, I would like to stop for questions, but I, I'm going to just blast through if that's all right, and then we'll see if there's any time left, because I just want to get to Evans' example of Napoleon. Okay, what's the question? Oh, just really it's like quickly. Like Sorry? It's like what? Chuck Norris, yeah. is it? Is that like Chuck? Uh, I, I actually don't. Know. I'm sorry to say I don't know who Chuck Norris is. Um, <laughs> is that like Chuck Norris? It is like Chuck Norris. Well, there you go. <laughs> I will look that up for next time. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. That was clearly very helpful. All right. Now you understand. Now it all falls into place. Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. Um, Evans' own example is Napoleon. Um, so that's um, a picture of Napoleon um, encountering the Sphinx. Um, Napoleon is the one on the left in, in the hat. Um, okay, um, uh, so uh, here are uh, two scenarios Evans discusses. Suppose an impersonator took over Napoleon's role from 1814 on. So this is Napoleon in his mature phase, as you can see. This is Napoleon after his great military victories, um, um, after he's uh, uh, been released from prison um, or got out of prison, um, and uh, an imposter takes over at that late stage, and it's actually an imposter of the mature Napoleon who fights at uh, Waterloo and loses. Okay, suppose that happened, and then the historians say, how, did, how would the historians describe that situation would you say Napoleon fought at Waterloo? Napoleon, oh sorry, Waterloo happened later, right? Waterloo was just about the last thing, big thing that happened. Yes, Napoleon fought at Waterloo. Sorry, if... If it was an ambassador and the historian... Oh, no, 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 no. Um, yes. Let us suppose that the historians now know the situation. Uh, Right, you're perfectly right, they would say that, but let me put it another way. If they said that he fought at Waterloo, Napoleon fought at Waterloo, would they be right? Okay, anybody think they'd be right? Very good. Okay, now then, um, the thing is, uh, because uh, uh, just summing up what we all think, here is mid-career Napoleon um, unifying Europe under the French um, Empire, and uh, this is the person who's the dominant source of all our beliefs about Napoleon. What happened when he was beat at Waterloo? I mean, in the English mind, that ranks pretty high, but uh, it's actually not you know, what you think of as main, the, his main achievement, if you see what I mean. Yeah? Um, so Napoleon refers to 
who, the dominant source of our cluster of beliefs about them, which is this guy um, out there uh, unifying Europe. Yeah? But now consider another scenario. Suppose that um, an impersonator takes over when Napoleon is just starting out. As you can see, here he is, hardly a beard, um, no hat. Uh, but, uh, so he's just beginning, and then an impersonator does him in and takes over. Um, so that um, this guy here is actually um, uh, the person who took over, the person who did him in and uh, took over at that point. So then the cluster of the typical historian would be dominantly of the impersonator. Yes? So if Napoleon was done in and taken over, or if, if this guy, was, <laughs> let me put it more neutrally, if this guy was, oops, if this guy was done in and taken over at a relatively early age, um, uh, our cluster of beliefs that we associate with the name Napoleon would be dominantly of um, this guy. Yep, the guy who'd taken over. The mid-career Napoleon. Yes? So in that case, if we said Napoleon fought at Waterloo, would that be true or false? Aha. Uh -huh. It would be true. True is the official answer. Um, put your, uh, I mean, everything is negotiable here. Put, put, your, put your hand up if you think it's true. If you think it's false. Aha. Uh -huh. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, is, let me just check that. You do, put your hand up if you do know exactly what I'm talking about, but maybe you're just not sure about the answer. OK. <laughs> I have to say that is less than overwhelming, but OK. <laughs> so here's Evans diagramming the situation. He says, um, here is uh, the first case in which we have, um, we have the early Napoleon um, making it through to mid-career before he is sandbagged and um, someone else takes over. And then when you say uh, N Napoleon is F, what you're talking about is this character. Yep, the character who made it through uh, to um, uh, his mature years before being um, bumped off. Yes? Whereas in this case, um, when uh, our character gets bumped off pretty early, in this case, when you're talking about when you're talking about the dominant source of uh, this collection of beliefs, then really you're talking about this person, Peter. If I'm explaining this correctly, this should be fairly straightforward. Yeah. So the thing is that if you uh, take this example to heart, then Kripke's kind of it's a causal picture, all right. But what matters is who's the dominant source of the information you have right now. Tracing back a causal chain through the mists of time to some initial dubbing isn't really to the point. Um, it doesn't really matter what the initial dubbing was. That's not the critical thing. What matters is um, uh, who's the dominant source of the set of beliefs that you have right now. One, two. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So, like, I mean, I think we have to be careful and say that, I mean, at least we have to be careful. Yeah. In choosing which initial dubbing is around. That's right. It, it, yeah. It seems like in some sense, what happened to doing it was just saying, it's just giving an account of which initial dubbing uh, you're going to use. So much uh, over moving. You could cast it in terms of, I, I hadn't thought of doing that, but you could cast it in terms of which dubbing is important. Yeah. I mean, I think part of the point of Evans's picture is to um, take away the idea of the dubbing ceremony itself as being an important idea. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Koska, <laughs> yeah. That's correct. That is a very interesting case because in, in that case, you might think that the my father part is really dominant. Yeah, it needs more discussion, that. Okay. 
Okay, let's take up that, uh, that kind of case next time. Okay, thank you.